My name is Ketu Mabaso. I'm the treasurer general of the communist part of Swaziland. I'll be doing the, 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 the I'll be sharing, I'll be the chairperson of, of, of this session. And we have, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a call, it's a joint uh, a session with the, the, the communist party of Swaziland and the South African communist party, Linda Chaban district. Under the topics, a seminar on imperialism and its impact on the Southern region. And we have our comrade from the South African Communist Party Central Committee member, comrade Alex Mashilo, who will be presenting to, to, to us. We will have uh, some discussions based from his key not addressed. And then he will come back and do a summary. Uh, greetings, comrades. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, comrades uh, from the Communist Party of Swaziland, uh, our facilitator, Comrade Katie, eh? uh, Comrade Pius from the Communications Department of the Communist Party of Swaziland. Uh, the National Political Education Commissar of the Zimbabwe Communist Party, Comrade Ian, greetings to you. Uh, before I can say anything, I must firstly apologize to you because I've been missing several of your calls while I'm in the trenches uh, of the political system and the challenges we experience in respect of policy. We will discuss some of those uh, challenges. Uh, let me also greet comrade uh, Alex Dilat from the party of the communist United States of America. Uh, special greetings to you, comrade, as well. Yes, and we also brought along someone else from us, so thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, comrades from the leadership of the South African Communist Party, the district of Linda Jabani under the leadership of Comrade Africa. Greetings to all of you. And uh, to every comrade uh, attending here today. I thought that uh, the time we were allocated was too long, but uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure whether we will reach seven o'clock or we will finish before then we will see because from where I come from, uh, education activities must not be designed to be too long. Uh, I said to Comrade Pius from the Communist Party of Swaziland when he invited me that given the amount of work that I had uh, in my hands, I wouldn't draft a full paper, I will use my notes. And I know that after sessions like this one, Comrades ask for, for the papers and they become circulated. I would rather do notes and listen to the input and generate a short paper afterwards. Our focus today is on imperialism and its impact on the Southern African development region in Africa. And before I can touch on that, let me deal with our base literature. Uh, on imperialism. That is uh, Vladimir Lenin's capitalism, the highest stage, sorry, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. That book, which was a profound intervention in the world working class, 
or communist movement represented an important contribution in the development of the body of work and action known since Marx and Engels as Marxism. Because among others of that contribution by Lenin, Marxism gave birth to a further development called Marxism Leninism, so based on Lenin's contribution. And that work, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, uh, was in fact a key contribution. I'm not saying the others were not key, but an analysis of the capitalist system and a point I will come to. Uh, giving birth to the theory of imperialism was one of Lenin's contributions. So I don't want to dwell a, a long time on that, except to say there are self-explanatory sections or chapters, if you may, in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. I will not be summarizing all of them. I will merely be drawing attention to some of them. And I will start with a key phenomenon that Lenin was studying, an even capitalist development. What lay behind an even capitalist development, both in terms of processes and the forces. So it is in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism that Lenin formulates from the study of capitalist and even development, the theory of imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. There are several characteristics or features of this stage that Lenin looked at. A key among them is that of, of which is general about capitalism, is a general thing about capitalism but under its growth into imperialism, that was like uh, moving at a very high speed. Uh, one comrade did not mute and the, the sound uh, causes some irritation. Thank you for muting. So before then, I was drawing attention to, I, I drew attention to capitalist and even development. It's worldwide spread. And I was drawing attention to concentration of production and growth of monopolies. What Lenin refers to as ever large enterprise under whose command production takes place increasingly as one of the fundamental features of this stage of capitalism, imperialism. In this stage, something happens. There is a transformation of banks from their principal and primary role as intermediaries in the making of payments. You see, and this is the beauty of a materialist analysis. So, and you will see also the beauty of this analysis taking place dialectically. 
So you have a, okay, the name bank comes from a bench. You know, this bench that you sit on, that is a bench. That's where the name comes from, uh, somewhere in Italy. And uh, in cross-border trade, uh, people exchanging money or currencies of different countries to facilitate the buying and selling of goods. And uh, this guy sitting on the bench over time, on the benches over time, are referred to as the band. So, so the band and this thing grow and their primary and principal function becomes that of facilitating uh, or becomes that of saving as intermediaries in the making of payments. I want to explain this in terms of modern day terms. Uh, a worker works for the government, whether in the United States or in Swaziland, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Lesotho, and Botswana. So this worker renders services for the state or another worker renders services for a private sector company, or another worker renders services for an NGO, non-governmental organization, or a co-op, or whoever that service is rendered for. Now, in the employer in paying the worker does not transfer the money to the worker directly. So the money goes to the bank and the worker accesses the money from the bank. So that is in cash forms, takes the cash in a process studied extensively by Marx, the circulation of capital to buy other commodities and services. So in today's terms that happens through the credit cards or the debit cards, or the numbers that we press on internet-based digital banking platforms and so on. So, so the banks were playing initially this as their principal or primary role, the making of payments, the making of payments for different people. So in the process, as they play that role, so, so much money was deposited to this bank that they became in charge of the money, which would later be referred to as finance capital. So, so this money that the banks transform from an inactive into active capital. So still in, in the money form referred to as finance capital, becomes a resource in their hands. It's a resource, you know? And access to this resource over time it transforms these banks from merely serving as, from merely serving their primary and principal function of intermediary, of serving as intermediaries in the making of payments. So they, they have so much resource at their disposal that this resource now has assumed the status of capital. And to access this resource, you go to these banks. So over time, not only did they transform in terms of their function, but they also transformed in terms of their size. So in the same way as in industrial sectors, you had increasing concentration of production and growth of monopolies. So these small intermediaries, learning in the old way to refer to as the middlemen, the banks, also transform from being from, from small intermediaries playing the role facilitating payments into oligopolies, into large, 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 large monopolies, so to speak. So that is a development we will come to. 
and I'm sure uh, my colleagues will add there. So, so, so the formation of monopolies and concentration of capital under their control becomes a key feature of the capitalist system. But, but along with that, something happens. So Lenin talks about the old capitalism and the new capitalism. So in the old capitalism, as I said, there were these people doing cross-border trade, selling currencies and so forth. And you still see them in countries like Zimbabwe. So in the border between Zimbabwe and South Africa and Swaziland and South Africa, Mozambique and South Africa, I have had the privilege to be there. You will see there are many small currency traders, especially on the side of the other countries other than South Africa. There are very few on the side of South Africa because the sector is hegemonized by a few banking oligopolies. We will come to that. Now, what happens when the Lenin says, so we begin to see a new era here. So in this new era, the change occurs where previously what we saw primarily in terms of international trade was the movement of goods between one country to another or from one country to another, so to speak, correctly. So the growth of imperialism and the transformation of banks as small intermediaries in the making of banks brings in a new phenomenon where not only goods move globally, so to speak, I'm using the word globally, it was not used at that time, I'm just using it today. So, when the, so you began to have increased cross-border flows of capital. So the export of capital uh, does not necessarily substitute the export of goods but it becomes a key factor, which also facilitates the export of this goods. So, so that's one of the key things that Lenin points to. I'm just starting with some bit of this uh, literature reviews. So Lenin in imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, engages with other people, some correct, some incorrect in their assertions, and others correct but incomplete in their assessments. One of them was Hilferding, who correctly observed that uh, an increasing proportion of capital in the industrial sectors ceases to belong to the industrialists. This increasing proportion of capital in the industrial sectors. So it ceases to belong to the industrialists who employ it. But this industrialist obtained it through the medium of the banks in which, uh, which in relation to them becomes the owners of this money capital. Like uh, if you saw during the COVID-19, during the height of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, there were schemes in South Africa, there was a scheme that was put in place and managed through the banks. And small, medium and micro enterprises uh, who faced challenges as a result of production downtime in the industrial sector and needed money capital to keep their firms floating, had to apply to the fund, all right? But that fund doesn't belong to them. So, but along with that transformation, something happens, you know? The capital, the industrial capitalists not only obtain the money capital, which also participate in profit making from the finance capital or the banks or the financial institutions. 
So that money capital is given on the basis of the assets. And in the process, it transforms and takes control of those assets. Uh, you begin to see this interweaving of finance and industrial capital. But as this interweaving of finance and industrial capital takes place, finance capital gains the role, a primary role. So gains a superior role, so to speak. So industrial capital becomes a subordinate. So even between the, the two factions of capital, if you were to use the word factions, but the correct word might as well be the two sections of capital and the old word is the, between the two capitals, finance capital emerges due to the power of the amount of money that it, it controls. This money comes from me and you. So most of you who are here have your deposits at the bank. Firms have their deposit at the banks. Small, medium, and micro enterprises have their deposits at the banks. Governments have their deposits, especially stupid governments. Uh, I almost mentioned the name of one stupid government, but let me just refer to a characteristic. A government that refuses to build its own presence in the banking sector. So that government transfers huge amounts of money and its reserve banks pushes its monetary policy through the commercial bank. And in the process, the commercial banks take cards, impose those interest rates, even if they are centrally regulated in the absence. So the government uh, acts like, uh, like, uh, like the, the beaver in the fable of the beaver. You know, the fable of the beaver by Antonio Gramsci in the uh, prison notebooks. This beaver was hunted by trappers for medicinal purposes. To save uh, his life, he teared off his own testicles and threw them away. So a government that, uh, that, uh, that refuses to build its own presence on behalf of the people in the banking and financial sectors pushes money through privately controlled or privately owned uh, commercial banks which in the process make use of uh, public finances and public deposits to generate profit, if you understand how banking works. So, so now, Hilfert King, in making this correct observation, uh, was incomplete according to Lenin because he did not realize that this process leads to the emergence of monopolies and concentration. Emergence of monopolies and concentration. So I'm just highlighting that from the reading of uh, uh, learning imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. So there are various other characteristics. And one of the things that Lenin does, once he drew our attention to the develop, to the victory, if we may call it, I'm not sure whether I'm correct, but let's refer to it hegemony. In fact, yeah, to be correct, Lenin draws our attention to the hegemony of finance capital over industrial capital in the interweaving between the two and materially demonstrates how that hegemony develops, how finance capital or the banks or financial institutions become hegemonic in their relationship to industrial capital and how in the process, because of the development of the system, they themselves cease to act as banks, but they become the actual industrialists. Uh, like a lot of restructuring, whether the restructuring that took place at General Motors in the US funded by Canadian uh, pension funds or US bailouts or other finances, if you look at that restructuring, uh, key decisions were not necessarily made by the industrial capital. So in giving you this money, in giving you these funds attached to a conditions and those conditions became, became the real rulers of what must happen because these conditions are so crafted in such a way that they have to turn this thing around and return back not only the primary loan, but the primary loan, the administration cost, plus the interest rate. 
So that's how they are, they are crafted in material terms. Many of our, some of our comrades just look at it in ideological terms, because this is the role now at, at, a, at a worldwide level played by institutions, Washington-based uh, institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And how did, it, did they play this role? So this brings us maybe to making an addition on what Lenin said. Because Lenin was analyzing industry and uneven an development uh, from the perspective of the theory of capitalist uneven development. But as the system develops, not only does finance capital gain hegemony over industrial capital, whether it is agriculture, mining, technology, and so on, but in the process, it gains hegemony over the government over the government's hires. If you look at the loan that Mswati obtained, it is called assistance. It is not an assistance, it's a loan. So Mswati has to pay it back with interest rates. And in paying back that loan with interest rates, Mswati has to give up the sovereignty of Swaziland, not to the democratic forces, or the people of Swaziland, but to institutions such as the IMF. My apologies, uh, uh, I'm in a meeting group. Huh? Let me not take the calls. My apologies to the young one. So like uh, Pius, you are fighting a battle for democracy in Swaziland. The king of Swaziland is prepared to cede the sovereignty, including the policy-making sovereignty of Swaziland to the IMF, but not to the people of Swaziland. To the IMF via the mechanism of the loans, but not to the people of Swaziland via the mechanism of democracy. So, so soon you realize that, okay, we are waging this battle for democracy in Swaziland. And the king there, the monarch, is standing in the way of democracy. But very soon you also realize that due to the commitments or the agreements that the monarch made to institutions like the IMF, Swaziland is not purely run by the monarch. It is also run by institutions like the IMF, through the conditionality that came with their laws. That in fact, the monarch no longer even, or the government subordinates to him, no longer even makes policy because policy came as a package with the loans obtained from the IMF. So the monarch becomes an intermediary between uh, the IMF and his interests. So, so that means that after achieving victory in the battle of democracy in Swaziland, you are going to face these institutions, the IMF. They have very long term, they go all over the world, talk about transparency, talk about democracy, but the conditionality they attach to the loans offered to the government are not transparent. They are also given to governments that are undemocratic. So you begin to have those institutions playing an anti-democracy role, so to speak. So I'm just taking democracy from an ordinary Thing. It is not the key focus of the of the of our discussion tonight. I'm just highlighting it. In South Africa, the government is selling bonds. So, in other words, the government is taking loans, like the U.S. government. The government in South Africa is taking loans 
So when it takes the loan, we call it, it is selling a bond. So those who buy the bond in return for interest rates, over time, over time, gain more say than the people. They have their institutions. Most of them are in Western Europe and the US called credit rating agencies. And those institutions exercise a certain amount of real power in the space, such as downgrading the credit rating of a country. If that country does not tow their line, you have seen this with South Africa. And if democratic forces are not careful, you begin to have government that think policy, not from the standpoint of the masses of the people, but from the standpoint of the credit ratings agencies and the monopoly. I'm using now the word monopoly because I've demonstrated the transition of the banks and financial institutions from smaller intermediaries to oligarchs to monopolies no longer in their country, but involved in the export of capital throughout the world and in the repatriation, if I may add, of surplus value from the export destinations of that capital. And the rule comprises in this and this only, perhaps, but perhaps not only, the rule comprises in this. Everywhere this capital is pushed, as Marx says in volume one, two, and three of capital, it is advanced in a smaller, in small amounts. When it comes back, it must come back in amounts greater than initially advanced. Just as it happened in, in production, where a capitalist perhaps advances a small amount through investment into production and labor adds value to the amount that has been advanced into production. And the growth of that value becomes a source from which the capitalists draw more money than they initially advanced into production. So even the export of capital works in that way like a sea. So it moves in a small amount into an export destination. But when it comes out of that export destination, it comes back in greater amount than was initially advanced. And even the rules pushed by finance capital are the rules to ensure and to maintain that movement in perpetuity. Now, in 2018, for example, 2019 August, to be specific, in South Africa, the National Treasury released what it called a blueprint, economic strategy for South Africa. That blueprint was first thought out from the principles decided from the principles decided by the IMF, but articulated by the Organization of Economic Development and Cooperation, OECD in France. In response to the 2008 crisis, the OECD created a research project with a publication called Going for Growth. And over years, it was making recommendations year in, year out on what countries must do. And finally, those recommendations became what the South African National Treasury revealed as the so-called economic, as the so-called structural reforms, all of them without exception. So when you hear the president of South Africa and the National Treasury referring to what they call structural reform, you may ignore the text that has the logo of the Republic of South Africa and read the text titled Going for Growth, released much earlier by the OECD, you will understand what they are talking about. 
So even when a process was open for public consultation, blah, 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 those so-called economic reforms became the final policy. What are they all about? If I may use the language of the OECD, they are all about opening up sectors occupied by the state or public participation to private sector participation and competition, period. Where you have a, a broadband spectrum in the hands of the state, that must be auctioned off to private sector forces. Where you have an XCOM, you must create private sector power generation capacity. More than one. While ESCOM is not modernizing, it will fight a struggle to modernize. In the ports where the state is occupying there, open that space for private sector participation and competition. In water, bring in the private sector. In this and that and that and that, bring in the private sector, it is called uh, so that word structural reforms, I mean, um, uh, we held a session earlier during the week where we were, someone said, hey, this word is very, it's a misnomer because we were, comp we were contrasting it with structural transformation. So instead of structural transformation, and remember that the word structural transformation can be categorized as of course, Marx used it when he talks about the general reshuffling of society. Can be categorized as progressive compared to the world, to the word system replacement or system transformation. So the replacement of the system by a new one. So structural reform means that you, you implement these measures that allow capital to make more profit. And you do so with a view that if they have more profits in their hands, they will invest and the economy will grow. As the economy will grow, you will be able to generate more state revenue from economic growth by means of taxation. So there is nothing about generally about the working class. If there is anything about the working class, that is a trickle down economics that things like employment will flow or will fall, will flow from advantaging capital. In Zimbabwe, this system of imperialism with the IMF playing a central role destroyed the economy of that country. So just before 1994, after that, young people like myself were being showed Zimbabwe as an example of an economy that was thriving. So one key weakness of the liberation movement uh, sometimes you grow the budget, social spending without paying attention to production, without building national production. Because like you can expand and ensure the provision of education, the provision of health, you can expand and ensure a progressive social policy. But at the end of the day, this progressive social policy must be funded. And one way to fund this progressive social policy is to build national production and make use of revenue policy or fiscal policy, including as, as well as monetary policy to finance progressive social policy. So, so if you advance progressive social policy without building and transforming the national structure of production to, finance, to fund it, and without transforming your fiscal and monetary policies to support it, at some point you are going to run out of resources. So that's what happened north of South Africa. Zimbabwe and the rest, when they gained independence, they moved in that line with the economy remaining. You see in countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe, those who are in charge of the economy are opposed fundamentally to those who are in charge of the government. There is a strife between the two. And those who are in charge of the economy have the support of imperialist forces. So, so as Zimbabwe ran out of money, they went to the IMF and the World Bank 
They borrowed money. That money came with strings attached called structural adjustment program. Once Mugabe implemented the structural adjustment program, there is no way that he could listen to the masses on what must go into policy. Because the structural adjustment programs, like the structural reforms of today, were a policy. So if policy is decided, democracy dies. Because policy is decided and packaged from Washington at the headquarters of the IMF. When it comes with the loan, it, already everything is decided. There is no way you can have democratic consultation for the people to express their policy views and to exercise sovereignty in informing the policy trajectory. Over time, what happens? This former liberation movement, there is a, there is, or uh, today we use the word social distance uh, when we deal with uh, the, the COVID-19. There is a distance, there is a political difference. There is a gulf growing between the masses of the people and the government. Over time, when these policies do not work, there is a gulf that grows. And the growth in this gulf between the government implementing policies from, so the IMF was not necessarily created, the, the IMF, when the IMF was created, John Maynard Keynes was negotiating passionately in favor of British imperial interests. And uh, White was in negotiating passionately in favor of new US hegemonic interests. And at some point with the crisis of capitalism in the 1970s, the US ensured that IMF loans go out with conditionalities. And those conditionalities were not just a matter of ideology or international policy. They were advancing the material economic interest of the bourgeois, of the ruling class of the US, particularly the bourgeoisie, in whose hands now production was concentrated in the form of multinational or transnational corporations. So if they wanted to penetrate a certain market with manufactured goods, the solution was that the country of the destination market must liberalize, must remove trade tariffs and so on. So that became a, a, well, a global movement. But in countries like Zimbabwe, when you know, the regime of structural adjustment programs collapsed and people saw reverses because one of the things demanded there was eliminate subsidies, eliminate social, eliminate this, eliminate this, reverse this, reverse that. In the process, on the ground, people were calling for the opposite, up to a point where this whole thing clashed and, it, and, and the explosion appeared as if it was conflict over land redistribution. And today, as we speak, the economy of Zimbabwe is almost as dead compared to what it was before, because that was followed by a massive capital flight, a massive capital flight, resulting in the total destruction of the Zimbabwean dollar that it became meaningless and Zimbabwe was dollarized. So, so that is just one typical example in, in, in Southern Africa. So imperialism, I move from the standpoint of the interweaving of industrial and finance capital, the emergence of the hegemony of finance capital in this interweaving, and the rise of the hegemony now of finance capital as the leading section of the ruling class. Not only over industrial capital, but also over government. I'm sure none of you in this meeting, especially South Africans, can proudly say you have made a contribution to what is called structural reforms today. I put it to you, you did not. They are not yours. They came from outside of South Africa. They were transmitted here via imperialist channels. We still didn't win that battle. So that's the impact. In Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, Botswana, Tanzania. Of course, our focus is, is on Southern Africa. Let me summarize the characteristics of all these African states, all of them. 
and I will draw attention to other continents. There is one thing. While all of them have achieved what they call independence, all of them have not transcended beyond the colonial features of their economy. The question is, what reproduces the things we used to refer to as the colonial features of this economy? In fact, there is a reverse movement in South Africa. Manufacturing as industry has been going through a decline in the contribution to national output and employment. So it's the reverse up to today. So you are experiencing deindustrialization. So none of the African states, none of the African states, none of them, despite achieving independence, none of them, there is no single one of them that transcended their previous colonially designed economic position or economic status, none of them. Scholars in Latin America studied this situation because Latin America is the same. So going back to the 1950s, but within the, the faculty of economics, Marxist Leninists came back. Uh, some of them talked about the, de the development of underdevelopment in characterizing the relations between what they called the core and the periphery. So even in Asia, none of the colonized countries ever transcended it. So there are just few countries there. China <coughs> is following a certain trajectory. Uh, some, because the US was establishing its presence there through certain states developed under that, that mechanism. But if you talk about Africa, you still have a problem. So the theory tonight is this. There are internal political, economic, and broader social transformation weaknesses. And there are, and, and those include problems of leadership internally. So I don't want us to exonerate internal problems. They are internal problems. And liberation movements in South Africa, in Southern Africa, including in South Africa, have been have fragmented after transitioning into government, have been fragmented. They gave back to more other, and the, fragment, the process of fragmentation is unfolding. And it also affects the trade union, the trade union movement. So there are internal problems. But imperialism remains a factor that reproduces the colonial status of these countries and their economies. So you have an interaction between two realities, the internal and the external realities in terms of which imperialism is a key force. And the interaction between the two reproduces the condition of underdevelopment. In some countries in Africa, actually, people are competing for elections in order to implement policies decided by imperialist forces via their various institutions. No independence in terms of thinking, in terms of the way forward. So if you listen, so, so many elections, some have taken place recently. It is just a question of who is in government. It is not a question that we are bringing a revolutionary breakthrough. And this is how we are going to be different. In fact, the competition seeks to appeal to the imperialists that we are your better implementer. And that competition also takes place through the ballot. And where I'm standing, I see it increasingly unfolding in South Africa. If the DA 
pushes the same measures as the ANC, for example, coming from the same imperialist centers, what is going to be the difference at the end of the day? Except redress, be rhetoric, and so on. So it appears that in a long term, we are destined for a general reshuffling of the lineup of forces. So the question is, how do we see that? So I don't want to speak from the point of view of, uh, of South Africa. And in conclusion, I want to draw attention to, to very difficult situation, worse than what we are talking about now. War in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has massive mineral endowments, including black carbon, which is used in the production of, of car, and plain tires. Lithium used in the production of battery and many other mineral resources. There is just no peace there. No peace there at all. So European imperialist forces are still at play. American imperialism is at play. There is just no peace there. Uh, that is one scenario, and many people, millions of people have been killed in Zaire, today's Democratic Republic of Congo continuous. Millions of people. Millions. So that's a worst case scenario. So I will end it here. I don't want to present a complete theory deliberately. I want to limit it here so that I allow space. I noticed that I started speaking 20 past five. It is now six, which means that I spoke for 45 minutes. So I'm leaving the time to you comrades to engage, to make additions and feel free to make subtractions. Enhance, because I, I think I was breaking the ice for you. Thank you, uh, comrade Katie. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, comrade uh, Alex, for your for your keynote address, you've opened our, our minds. You've reminded us because the struggle still continues as long as we're still under the capitalist uh, system. And you spoke uh, at length about the, the monopoly in capitalism that I would say is stealing from our resources. Yes, it is true. And they have some certificate, uh, let me call it maybe illegal uh, ways to rob us daylight. For an example, the issue of policies that you're talking about, uh, where people are not, the, especially the working class majority are not even in, in involved in terms of making those policies. There are bank charges that we don't know how did they, how did they come from? Like how are they calculated? This month is a different figure. The following month is a different amount. So that is what we are practically experiencing as as the working class. Moreover. In terms of AMA inflation, petrol, for an example, we don't know. We wake up, they're telling us that a petrol kupugi, the petrol say how, how we're not involved. We we don't know. The education system during the examination that now you need to sit one on one. During classes, there was nothing like one by one, which like it, it's a crisis that we need a, a, a to fight as, as the working class. You're talking about that in Africa, there is no independence country, although they're saying people, countries are saying they're independent, they're democratic, but in terms of economic, that is the opposite. So that's what we must also engage, engage on. And lastly, we were talking we're having a session as the Communist Party recently about the ideology and cultural challenges that they are being faced by the South people. And we did find out that in terms of economic and 
ideology. Uh, we, we are not there. Yes, we do believe, we do know that our ideology is for the interest of the people, but the economy that is currently happening doesn't belong to the, to, to, to the working class. Thanks very much, comrade. We will go to, to, to comrade, uh, we're going to the commissars now. Uh, the commissars of the communist parties, the commissar of the communist party of Swaziland, comrade uh, Titus. She, he is the youngest commissar, I think, so far. And then he will just reflect from the address from comrade, uh, comrade Alex, but based on what is happening in Swaziland. Then after we will have uh, our comrade uh, um, commissar from the Zimbabwean Communist Party. He's not the youngest. Is the opposite. So he will just also reflect from the keynote address based on what is happening in Zimbabwe. Then after that, Comrade, then we'll discuss and then Comrade Alex will summarize. Thank you, Makaba. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Comrade Ketsiwe. My name is uh, Status Mpati Vlagat. Um, the Comi National Commissar of the Communist Party of Swaziland. Uh, I would like, uh, I, will, I will start by thanking the, the Linda Chaban for giving us, uh, the Linda Chaban Institute for giving us the, the opportunity with the Communist Party to, to partner with them in their, in their assembly. Thank you, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, under the, 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 the topic imperialism and its impact on Sadak region. Uh, the imperialism in Swaziland can be traced as far as uh, in the 1960s, uh, comrades, when the white interest group and the apartheid government persuaded Sopuza, the then king, who is the father to Mswadi, the present king of Swaziland, to form a political part because they preferred him uh, more than any of the leader of political parties at that time. So he, in the process, this imperialist together with the apartheid government provided a Sopuza with a financial support and organizational resources for the formation of his political party, which we now know as Imbogot or political movement. So comrade, what we have in Swaziland as we speak now, uh, we have a great, a great, uh, and what we can say, a major influence of Emma imperialist. Not long ago, the late prime minister in Swaziland, Wild Man I mean, uh, said the, the corporate tax is going to be decreased. The corporate tax is going to be decreased from a uh, 27.5% to 17.5%. I think that was a 10% difference. When compared, you look at the corporate tax, these are the taxes that applies to those big uh, multinational companies. We're not talking about the, the corporate, corporate tax, we talked about the tax being paid by the multinational companies in Switzerland, we have Bo, MTA and Bopik and Pay, Bo ShopRite. All those uh, companies, they are from, they are, they, we can safely say they are imperialist companies because they are multinationals. In Switzerland, you still have banks, banks such as the Standard Bank, First National Bank, the net bank, all these banks, they are from South Africa. So any of these banks, they, they keep on, they keep on uh, benefiting from the, rock, from the rock, rock elements of the regime. As we speak now in schools, we have what we call the orphan vulnerable children. These are orphan and other kids who are vulnerable, but they still pay the school fees through these banks. And the banks, they accept these uh, monies from the kids. So it shows good even the banks, they're in bed with the regime. As we can say, Comrade Guti Valley, the banks themselves, they are, they are part and parcel of the imperialist forces in the country. Uh, as we speak, Comrade, it's Switzerland heavily re relies on South African customs unions, uh, which we refer to as SAC. So they, 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 they fully depend on these uh, SAC recipients and this makes them vulnerable. So such things make the country to be vulnerable from the, from the imperialists because Bona, they don't have much, they can contribute to the economy since 
80% of our of our imports in Swaziland, they are from South Africa. So it also shows how deep imperialism in Swaziland is. And it also shows how and why the other uh, organs like SATA, AU, they are very, very quiet when it comes to the brutality the citizens of this country face from the regime. So they keep on changing. They, I think their support is not that, uh, we don't feel their support as a as, as SADAC, as a, and the AU is not helping us in any way, as you can see now, Comrade Kuti. Since the unrest in the country, we have never received anything, maybe a message of support. The only thing we see, we saw, it was when I think around the, around the 40 people were dead. Then SADAC released a statement, I think we all are aware, saying only one, that instead of condemning the, the government, Sadak, in his statement, was basically saying uh, he's calling for calm and so forth and stuff like that. So it shows how these uh, imperialists are, are in bed with the regime. Also, now there's a, there are elderly crimes. Ever since uh, COVID 19 started here, uh, the elderly crimes, some of the elders were, were being paid at uh, maybe at those Dingunda centers centers and some in schools, but they have transferred the, that now to MTN Mobile Man. So it shows good even the imperial, the, the, the multinational companies uh, like MTN, they are still benefiting because now when, they, when, when the old person withdraws the cash from that uh, mobile man, there are charges there. And the, from, those, from those charges, MTN is benefiting from such. Yes, completely. And now we have still have stores like Bo, Bo Pride. Also, have stores, but pick and pay. I would like to sing it out in the pick and pay because recently uh, we made aware good see the king uh, have shares through African Alliance. They are they are the ones who bought uh, the pick and pay franchise in Swaziland. So they are still benefiting from such act of the regime. We also have but okay, but okay. We also have good see, one of the king's son is also having some shares from that. I think. By so doing, it shows good they are still benefiting from, from the regime. There are so many uh, companies company that are still benefiting from these imperialist organs. Uh, in the, I think the large part of the law field, a uh, particular the Lubombo region, as you can see, comrade, uh, is now <coughs> used to, to farm sugar cane. And that sugar cane is uh, that project is fully sponsored by the European Union. They built a, a dam around the Spofan. They built a dam in Spofan, and there's also a bridge. I think it's called around billions. It shows good thing. These guys, they, they were not doing it in favor of the Swazis, but they built those roads for that they can have a, a, a better <clears throat> transportation of their of their sugar from the farms to to the to the machinery for a refiner. So it shows good see, they made the the footprint and they are they are they are, they are what we can say they are control over the sugar industry in the country. The sugar industry well is largely, if not if not all of them, is largely owned by the by the European Union. We also have countries who have their presence in the country, like the United States. We still have the United States here. And it is, it is. I think what we are, what we are seeing now, it is the one that is busy conducting this uh, program, such as bomb circumcisions and so forth and stuff like that. But this United States is seeing, good we'll see, uh, the king is, mus is misusing the fund, but they keep on supporting the health system, which was going to be taken care of by the fiscals. Whereas the, the fiscals that is supposed to take in care of these health centers and uh, the, the hospitals, is being misused by the king, but when they keep funding uh, this institution, knowing very well with a large chunk of money that this was, was destined to be used on, that, on those facilities is being uh, taken by the king and to use it to buy uh, or to, to fund his lavish lifestyle, to buy the Rolls Royce, to buy the, the aeroplanes and the, the, the fleet of BMWs that we have seen recently. We also have comrades uh, uh, in our country, the presence of Taiwan, any day with this uh, aeroplane uh, that is being used. Now, it's, in fact, it's a chopper that is being used by, by the soldiers. Uh, I think that is the one that is busy 
uh, causing some confusion and it's being used at night to, mo to monitor the curfew. And it was also, it's also used during my protest, these aeroplanes used by the arm. Uh, we, uh, we have, we have some have, uh, uh, have told us recently that this aeroplane was bought by uh, the, Th the Taiwanese. So they presented, I think there are two in the country. They were given by the Taiwanese to the king. So it also showed good if really these imperialist comrades are not here to assist us as far as this, but they are here uh, to make sure good see, they support the regime uh, against the will of the people. So comrades, as we, can, as, we, as we are talking right now, uh, the kids in schools in Swaziland, they are still, uh, there's a, there are major protests in the country by the kids. They are saying they want democracy and they want it now. There's, we don't have a major progress in our country when it comes to, in terms of education, all the stuff, even the tertiary students, my universities, uh, they are still protesting for their allowances. They are still protesting for some of them, all of the of the students who are not allowed to uh, to get their results because they are still owing. So what they are advocating for, they are advocating for a, a free quality education comrade. So I think some of the comrades are co as they are going to make to make some major expositions of this imperialist. I think I've unpacked some of the things that the um, the imperialists are doing in our country. They are not doing justice to the masses of this country, comrades. I would like to end here for now, comrades teacher. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Commissar from the Communist Party of Swaziland for the reflection. It is true. And that in Swaziland, in, in, in terms of economic, the imperialists, it's only the feudal, feudal uh, uh, system, the, the, the real family that benefits, and the capitalists, the Swazi people, they're not benefiting at all. And we are going to the franchise part that the French, the, the French are also like the, the imperialists are also benefiting. And this. In, in that case, franchise, when you buy a franchise, you're buying the, 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 the brand. It means that in Swati is fully 100% uh, gaining from pick and pay. He is fully gaining from Puma, okay, in Swaziland. And the Swazis are not benefiting the whole. So those are the challenges that we are having and, and challenges that can be overcome and we need to overcome those challenges. And now we can move on to the next uh, commissar from the Zimbabwe Communist Party. Over to you, Comrade Ian. Uh, can you hear me now? Hello? We can, yes, Commissar. Yes. Okay, good, right. We've heard from Comrade Alex and from your commissar from the CPS. Yes. The Christian. problem. We, 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 we've heard the problems, but what are the solutions? We have to start looking at, at solutions and not only problems. Um, one of the uh, interesting historical phenomen phenomena that we've seen in Zimbabwe and South Africa is that the old white racist regimes were more independent of foreign monopoly than uh, the current the current regimes led by liberation parties. Um, and it was more so in Rhodesia than in South Africa, but nevertheless, there was a degree of economic independence and economic planning at a local level. And this is where I keep telling people there's a lack of understanding and it's made even worse by the current spate of uh, racist ideology, anti-white racist ideology, which we're seeing in in South Africa, led by EFF and by Zuma and, and others, because they're only looking internally. And there was a historical problem as well, uh, created by the idea of uh, colonialism of a special type. Not that it was entirely wrong, but by looking at co colonialism of a special type, that people were 
sharing the same territory and the it was the whites who were colonizing the blacks which was completely true but was ignoring the real imperialists which are the guys in the usa britain and france and other other countries and the when african liberation really started it was part of the imperialist agenda that they wanted black governments but they wanted black governments which they could control and they are not interested in building industry in africa in fact they've destroyed industry in zimbabwe and they're continuing to destroy industry in south africa because they don't need uh Afri african countries to do what the asians have done and compete with them in terms of industry right so where are we going to go our program as a zimbabwe communist party is called completing the liberation of zimbabwe because the liberation was not completed uh, by the way i want to just slightly disagree with with comrade alex in africa we had one country which was independent of foreign control and that was libya uh and yeah it was bombed out of existence by obama and his friends and the the other country which was headed towards economic independence was ghana under Nkrumah. so there have been attempts for genuine independence so what do we need every communist party in every african country must have a clear program for economic independence um it, it will not necessarily be a socialist program but should be a national economic program which seeks to build industry independent of outside control if we don't do that we cannot win um one what the country we're very interested in um because the way that it's organized its economy is bolivia in in south america where they've taken a lot of notice the government has taken a lot of notice of the different indigenous groups it's not like some other south american countries the majority of people are not of of uh, spanish origin they're of indigenous origin so that's been looked at but more importantly what's been looked at is they've developed the economy and as we know there was a coup which was overthrown and they actually sent back a world bank loan so they've developed the economy while they are uh, building the living standards of the bolivian people and i think we have to look at that example as something that we can do here and as far as i'm concerned it's and as far as the zcp is concerned the time for the liberation movements if not entirely over is now coming to a, to a close and the communist parties need to establish themselves throughout africa uh, and here I want to be very, uh, I, I want to criticize the South African Communist Party very much here, because October last year, we started, we had a meeting where we revived, or were trying to revive ALNET, the African Left Networking Forum. And we were supposed to have we actually called for a meeting before the end of the year. That never happened. Uh, I know others in the SACP wanted the meeting to happen January or February of uh, this year. It never happened. And up till now, we have had no ALNIF meeting. And, it, and the SACP was given the, the, the task of, of organizing uh, ALNEF until we got all the players uh, in. So please, uh, 
I beg Comrade Alex, take it back to the uh, leadership of, of, of the SACP because we, we, we highly respect the, the leadership of the SACP, but to be honest, on this one, we've fallen down, we, we need to reorganize ALNEF and we need to spread communist ideas uh, throughout Africa. We're very happy, for instance, um, Communist Party of Kenya, which I think uh, I, tr I try to invite here, but at a late uh, time, is, is also a new Communist Party. Uh, it seems to be doing very well. We also have the Socialist Party of, of Zambia, maybe not quite along the lines that we would like, but we have to bring in all these organizations into the fold and come up with a common program for the whole of Africa. We cannot just hang out alone. It's not going to work. We have to work in coordination with, with the whole of Africa. And obviously uh, we start off with our region, the, the Sadiq region, and we must come up with strong, clear policies, which are acceptable to all the people. And Comrade Alex talked about as well, the basis must be production. And what are we seeing right now? We're seeing the collapse of neoliberalism. Even in the capitalist countries, they're moving away from neoliberalism to a more controlled form of, of, of capitalism. Um, Germany, for instance, has a very large uh, state-owned sector. It's definitely a capitalist country, but they're more successful than, than other countries in, in Europe, like Britain, which is really... Uh, uh, which, which has really swallowed the US line completely. Uh, so we need to each and every country, and I've said this to the Swazi comrades, it's no use just fighting against the monarchy. You need to tell people that once the monarchy is done, this is our program. This is our immediate program. This is our long-term program. And uh, again, and I'll say to the South Africans who are here, I don't have much problem with the SACP being part of government, but we're not seeing the organization on the ground that can push government with the SACP. You've got a huge membership. And what, should now be happening is that the all the ANC branches, all the trade unions, all the uh, residents associations, as far as possible, should be led by communists, and communists must be trained and deployed. Uh, and the last thing I, I want to say, uh, because we had this discussion on Facebook the other day with, with Tommy Alex. We're looking at the sad state of the South African Broadcasting Company, SABC. Uh, and to be honest, the role that it's played is not at all progressive, it's reactionary. Uh, and for, for, for myself, I'm not that bothered if, if it collapses because, uh, but what I would prefer is it to become more progressive in the way that it portrays the news. Uh, again, the way that history is taught in the schools. Uh, it's quite, it's not history, it's ideology from the point of view of, of imperialism, which is being taught even in South African schools and in, in other countries where there's been uh, liberation movements. So, there's a huge task ahead of us. We have to train cadres and we have to train them both ideologically and Comrade Alex in South Africa has done a huge job there. We have to train cadres both ideologically and practically because it's no use having the ideology 
if you're not working with the people on the ground inside the trade union movement and uh, inside the uh, community organizations we have to do we have to do that it's an absolute necessity so there's a lot of work to be done and uh, I'm, I'm afraid what i've seen and we've got in zimbabwe as well even within our own party we've got too many people who think that uh, politics is something you do at the weekend you know when you've got a bit of spare time that has to go if we really want to change what's happening we have to train our people we have to have programs in each country and across the whole of, of our continent and unless we do that we won't move i think i Said enough. Thank you. Thank you, Com thank you, thank you, Commissar. Thank you, Commissar uh, from the European Communist Party. Thanks for your presentation. Yes, he has just illustrated the issue that the 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 the, 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 the imperialists are not interested in terms of building my industries in 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 Africa, especially in Zimbabwe. But let's say in Sadak. They are not interested, of which we all know what is, what is their interest is for them to make more profit. That's their, their interest. And then he came more on solutions. He was more on solutions that uh, uh, all, uh, e e the economic uh, uh, problem is not independent. Yes, we need to be independent as countries. We need to come up with some way so that we can be economically independent. He also came up with the fact that it is our duty as communists to train cadres. That's the fact that without training cadres, there's no way that we can pursue our goal for socialism and, and communism. And then he also came with a point that a SACP was 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 mandated to organize the awareness, so to, to organize a, the other countries, the communist countries who maybe some 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 engagement in terms of how best can we can we can we pursue the goal. It is true, no Kabane, but then I, I I also have a question because we need to come up with some way forward that if maybe a, a, a country or an organization is mandated and it's not maybe due to some challenges implementing that does that means that we cannot do some means now as communist countries because we cannot sit down and, and, and wait for an organization to, 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 to help in terms of implementing, whereas it cannot. But then let's not forget our topic of today, the cinema on a, a seminar on imperialism and its impact on the Sadak region. What are the challenges that, or the, 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 the implementation that the imperialist are doing in the Sadak region? And what is it that the Sadak is doing? Do we really have Sadak leaders or we just have Sadak allies? So we also need to, to, to dwell on that so that we can come up with a proper way forward. Because we we'll keep on saying, yes, we do have the region as a Sadak, but in terms of the leaders, these leaders are progressive leaders or they're just nationalist leaders. So that's what I think we need also to, 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 to dwell with so that we can, we can help ourselves. What are the common factors within SADAC which can be found as limitations for left solidarity, which could be linked to impact of imperialism? Secondly, has imperialism nested in full within SADAC? and which country currently highly affected. Thirdly, is the demobilization of society within Sadak, in particular around waging resistance against capitalism or imperialism in a coordinated country by country due to imperialism? Oh, comrade Alexi, I think we have grasped those questions. You can also, in your summary, try to 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 to, to answer. Okay. So thank, you, you, comrade, comrade. Uh, thank you, comrade. Thank uh, you, comrade Tetiwe, and uh, comrades. 
all comrades present here. I just want to get the question on Ethiopia. First. Oh, so Ethiopia under Mengistu. All right. All right, comments. You see, uh, just to, so comrade Ian, we are on one page only. The difference is that I crafted what I say in the present tense and not in the past tense. If I may repeat the point, not a single African country that achieved independence has transcended it has transcended the colonial features of its economy. And that includes today, Libya. And the key question I put forward was, in the past, these were created and sustained through colonialism. Today, this are reproduced through imperialism and internal weaknesses. I think I said so. And that includes the Libya as it stands today. Uh, on the 25th of September, 2021. By the way, even under brother leader Muammar Gaddafi, Libya, the economy of Libya was still based on oil. So if you look at uh, what Latin American scholars criticized as the colonial international division of labor in which the center or the core <coughs> sorry, of the countries my apologies, in which the center or the core of the countries in the capitalist system, such as the Western European colonial powers, the US and Japan, if you studied their production processes, you would see that the economy of Libya was still that of mineral extraction with oil, a key mineral. It sort of didn't transcend that. What was powerful in Libya, though, was the redistribution of the proceeds of production in the form of a collective social policy. And as I said, like in other African countries that was destroyed through imperialist interference. I won't call it intervention. It was not an intervention. It was interference. So up to today, and even the levels of industrialization that you had in South Africa have been, and, 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 and in so far as that referred to a man, the manufacturing sector, together with its employment has been declined. That's a reality. That's a reality we face today. And as you said, the point is, how do we overcome that reality and move forward? Because what we experience under colonial domination is reproduced under imperialist exploitation and domination. A reality. So that's a reality that we face today. Let me deal with, I wish to make use of the example put forward by comrade uh, Titus Villacat. And I wish to demonstrate using the materialist conception of history 
the political economy of the decision and what neoliberals are asserting. By the way, by the way, a point I wished to indicate earlier but did not, which I now wish to indicate. What Lenin referred to as the higher stage of capitalism, which was imperialism and still is imperialism, has intensified. And its dominant form today is that of neoliberalism. So if you wish to to assess the extent of the impact of imperialism in your Southern African country, you just need to assess the extent to which neoliberalism has penetrated economic policy thinking and restructured the economy of the country. Let's deal with this. The reduction of corporate tax. If you may make use of this in any national currency, so I will not refer to a specific currency. If tax, if corporate tax, is 18% of any national currency, or if it is 27 or 28%, and you reduce it by any percentage, the rest are sure. In materialist conception of history, the political economy of that decision transfers the difference to profit. So let's say if you make a profit of 10 pence, I will use this pen. If you make a profit of 10 pence and you pay corporate tax, once a uh, two, two, two percent of that 10 pence, and that is reduced by a percentage down. That means the 1% that is no longer taxed, you have it in your hands as part of your profit. That's how you gain. So I wish to, I just wish to, to demonstrate the political economy in materialist conception terms of the movement against corporate tax. So this movement happens in South Africa as well, where in the last budget, South Africa reduced corporate tax, reduce corporate tax. Let me not be bothered with the, fig, uh, the figures, but there was a cut in corporate tax. So what is the neoliberal theory saying about this? Of course, in material terms, the difference goes to profit. So it is the bourgeoisie in material terms who immediately benefit from the decision in that now they can count more profit. The difference coming from the reduced tax, the reduced corporate tax. So the neoliberal scholars argue that if you reduce corporate tax, you will make your country competitive as a destination for this export of capital we talked about earlier. So it is called foreign direct investment. So you will make your country an attractive investment destination of the money to come because your corporate tax is lower compared to other countries. So that is their argument. But that argument, takes place in the context where every country, so in other words, world countries, or you may even say southern countries, are uh, pit against each other in a race to the bottom. So 
all of them now must come together and compete by reducing corporate tax with the idea that the lower the corporate tax, the higher the investment uh, flows you will receive. And in the process, as you know, when you reduce state revenue, you are also reducing the capacity of the state through that its revenue to respond to the needs of the people. So how do you respond to the needs of the people? So in terms of this neoliberal theory, so when corporations experience a reduced tax scenario, and of course, as I said, that will transfer the difference to their profits. So according to the neoliberal theory, corporations will now have more in their hands to invest. So they will return the savings they generated from the reduction in corporate tax into the economy in terms of investment, and that will create employment. So that is the theory. That is the theory. But I task you to go and look at the economy of South Africa. We have been on a trajectory where we reduce corporate tax, and that trajectory has been accompanied by a trend in falling investment in the economy. Okay? So you see, as a Marxist comrades, we need to also follow this data. So, there, so investment is falling. There is, however, a particular investment destination that appears to be lucrative, particularly to the capital exported from elsewhere and which becomes import in South Africa. That is the hot money market, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So, and that is attracted by means of high interest rates. You can look at the interest rates between Japan, South Africa, and the United States. In fact, the official policy of the Federal Reserve of the United States is that of ensuring moderate long-term interest rate, which is a progressive policy compared to the policy followed in South Africa. So, however, South Africa, South Africa is following a policy of high interest rates. And one of the mechanisms the country uses interest rates for is inflation targeting. So the assumption, the, the, the basic idea is the higher the interest rate, so high interest rates will discourage consumption. And by consumption, uh, that includes people going to the bank to borrow money in order to consume goods and services. So if interest rates are high, that will be discouraged. And as that is discouraged, inflation will not rise because uh, demand will be discouraged. Remember one thing, I'm now employing the term demand in a carefully weighted way. Demand, you see in Johannesburg, as we say in our classes, you can pass people sleeping under a bridge next to the University of Johannesburg in Durenfontein. Or you can pass a man or a woman or a child hungrily and crying Dicking a dustbin for food. In capitalist terms, that doesn't count as demand for food. In capitalist terms, the people you see sleeping under the bridges and in the shacks that are so overcrowded do not constitute demand for houses. So the word demand has a class meaning. So in capitalist terms, it refers to it is, it, it is anchored in the meaning attached to a commodity. It refers to, because commodities are, are produced for sale so that the capitalist can draw 
can cash out from the commodities, the value added during the production process from the exchange value of the commodities and heap up that labor as their private property, which is actually what makes them never to be secure about private property because they have at most clarity where it comes from. It is an accumulation of the labor value added in production and that labor value is added by others. It is an expropriation in other words. And they always live in fear that the expropriated will stand up and demand that which they were expropriated. So hence their politics or political economy politics of private property. So what happens here is I was just explaining why I am carefully using the word demand. So I'm not using the word demand in the same way as the liberals or neoliberals or mainstream economics use it. As a Marxist, I recognize that a hungry young, a hungry child who is digging a dustbin in Johannesburg, crying because of the pain from the hungry stomach, looking for food in the dustbin, that person to me as a Marxist represents demand for food. But in capitalist economics, that doesn't represent any demand for food. Okay? So, so, so because of the high interest rate structure, that tends, that, that monetary policy tends to attract inflows into the hot money market. So these are short-term investments. So the short-term investment do not go into the real economy or into the productive sector of the economy. So these are investment in, in money dealing transactions in capital transaction, okay? So, so that when in another market, interest rates are increased and those markets give you more yields or returns than the ones you enjoy, you run away, you sell their currency, you run away to where the interest rates are increased. If the Federal Reserve in the US can increase interest rates, and given the differences between the South African rent and the US dollar and the advantages that has in moving to that market, you will experience an outflow of capital. So in 2001, the whole year from January to December, South Africa experienced a massive outflow of capital resulting in a currency crisis because of a, a neoliberal shock therapy that was imposed under gear. So I'm saying this because I wanted to explain the political economy of uh, this uh, race to the bottom in the reduction of corporate tax and who gains in class terms. And, the, and of course the neoliberals are saying, no, if capitalists now have more money because you as workers are just going to consume the money so the capitalist will invest. So, so this theory doesn't look at the idea that, okay, if the, man, if the worker has more, the consumption of that money will result in upward conditions in production. Because if the worker buys more, then uh, a volumes in whatever they buy in production must be uh, adjusted upwards. There must be an increase in production to respond to the increased buying and selling calls uh, 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 demand. So there are those things, there, there, there are those things. But at this moment, especially the developing countries are pit in a race to the bottom to reduce, to reduce corporate tax. And as they reduce corporate tax, personal income tax become a major component in their state revenue. And unfortunately in countries like Swaziland, Zimbabwe and South Africa, personal income tax is also facing challenges. Why? Because of a high rate of unemployment. Why? Because there has been restructuring at the workplace like worldwide, where there are labor brokers, where there is casualization, where employment has been temporarized, where those people who were relatively being paid better because of that 
associated with their permanent employment. So the wage rate, the share of workers in the economy has gone down. So the level of inequality are so high that the number of people who are earning, you know, middle income and high income earners, that number has, is shrinking while those ones at the bottom are really earning peanuts. And these ones who have been taxed are feeling the pinch. So that's why they are tax wars. So in South Africa, to overcome this, recently they increased co a, 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 a value added tax. Now, I just highlighted that Swaziland, South Africa reduced corporate tax. And we talked about concentration of production. I wouldn't talk about sub imperialism because I don't want to introduce that at this stage. So how do you identify concentration of production, but also trade? You will see that more and more in this country, uh, the firms are the same, the retail stores are the same. That's concentration. So that's one characteristic of this phase of capitalism we are discussing. The major and uh, the challenge for us is how do we overcome this? and move forward. What are the common characteristics? In fact, what are the common limitations in SADC? Let me start from the economy. SADC economies, all of them, still reflect colonial features of raw material extraction and export, reliance on raw material, very, very weak industrial structures, except for South Africa. Even where in South Africa, the industrial structure is relatively stronger than other countries, which means that it gives you also the force that Marx talked about, the proletariat, which has the potential of driving a revolution. Okay? For example, who drives the revolution in Zimbabwe in the absence of the proletariat? Uh, the, the, the Zim proletariat is in the common labor market shared between Zimbabwe and South Africa, but which is geographically located in South Africa. So you do not have a strong proletarian movement, okay? Uh, except in South Africa, you have a strong proletarian movement, but trade unions are increasingly fragmented and divided because of both subjective and objective factors. So the power that you need to fight for change is weakening. And if you are not careful subjectively, you might end up even blaming the Communist Party that has to play a role in. And even in the Communist Party, don't arrive in a trade union scenario and say, you know, when you read the first chapter of the Bible, if I can give you an example. They say, God said, let there be the well, there was the light, let there be the light, there was the light, let there be the sun, the breeze, and there was. You don't do that in a working class environment. It is very difficult. You are doing it also in the context of people who are competing against each other for the leadership of the trade unions. And some of the people who lose break away completely. So it is not an easy thing. It is not like the genesis. I'm just using the Bible, you know, because it, 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 is, it is just presenting this thing in an easy scientific way. Let there be the day, there was the day. Let there be the sun, there was the sun. Let there be the sea, there was the sea. Let there be these. Oh, there were no trees. Let there be trees and so on. So that's not how you exercise working class leadership. So there are very different circumstances on the ground. The way forward, we need, regardless of the weaknesses we face, we need to work very hard to unite the workers, independently of nationality. Independently of nationality. And within these countries, we need to work very, very, very hard to build working class power. That requires unity. And that unity has to be unity in perspective and unity in action. We need to work very, 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 very hard. 
And I can tell you, the more imperialism penetrates and deepens, the more difficult will this start. You see, imperialists, if you look at the US, that's what they do. They create small groupings. They call them civil society organizations. They fund them. Small groupings, you know, they fund them. And they have a funding muscle. If you look at the Soros, if you look at the Open Society Foundation and so on, so democracy is highly, 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 highly contested. And in South Africa, the situation is even going to be very difficult because you are competing in the context where you do not have a source of funding. And the people on the other side have all the muscle and financial support from the bourgeoisie. Some of the things blamed on you can be true, but some of them can only be subjective without an assessment of the difficulties on the ground. So we really, really, really need to work very hard I cannot uh, emphasize the importance of reviving uh, the Africa left network. That is so crucial. But because since we are talking about Southern Africa here, we need to, to think about. So far, at least we have the Communist Party of Zimbabwe, which is nascent, it is very young. The Communist Party of Swaziland is relatively young. And, and I'm speaking from the point of view of the 100 years of the Communist Party in South Africa. Very recently, comrades in Kenya established a Communist Party. Uh, we have uh, a Communist Party in Sudan. We have uh, several other progressive parties. So I think we need to, to look at organizing revolutionary forces in Southern Africa, because uh, ALNEF was not only a Southern African initiative, it's an African initiative. So, so I think we must, we must organize in every region in the continent, in Southern Africa, in East Africa, in North Africa, uh, and in West Africa. We need to work very hard. But you, you see, complaints. Uh, our four BS fought colonialism under difficult conditions. So the current conditions prove to be more difficult than that. So we cannot afford to concentrate divisions in our own camps. That's why this thing of unity is essential. Some of the people that we need to unite with are not necessarily communists, are not necessarily socialists. They are just nationalist progressives. So we need to maximize the strength of our camp as a revolutionary movement. So that is the, it is two minutes past seven. So I will say we went two minutes beyond the set time if I were to speak from where I am. Whatever questions will be asked from here, I will not even return. I will not answer. Let's take those questions if there are any as, a, as an assignment uh, we should meet again to look at. Thank you so much, Conrad. Thank you, thank you very much, Comrade Alex. Thank you, thank you very much for all comrades who, 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 who took upon to themselves to participate and, and, and take their time uh, uh, for, for, for this session. The issue of unity is very crucial. It is very important. But as communists, we need uh, to draw a line because when we're talking of unity, unity for what? If we do have people who are not interested in the working class question, what unity are we going to form? It's, it's, it's a very a, a big challenge, especially us in Swaziland that we are facing, that some comrades will say, let's form unit unit. And people, they're not there, they're not persuading, they're not interested in the, in the, in the struggle for the, for, the, for the workers, for the working class, but to pursue their personal interests. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much hoping that we will have another session as soon as possible. We need to push a, a, another, another, another session a, like this. Aluta Continua. Thanks, uh, thanks Comrade Ketchum. I, I just wanted to say one of our key tasks, maybe arising out of this discussion in all our Southern African countries, is to reclaim the policy space from imperialist forces, imperialist institutions, and their surrogates in our country. If we can achieve that, 
we can begin to shape policy direction. But that means political and class power combat. Thank you.